Hello. So, this is the ninth lecture. We have seen part one. <coughs> the rules for the study of art and literature. And uh, second, and criticism also. And part two, we saw the causes for wrong judgments made by the uh, critics. And now we have got the part three, ethics and morals, morals and ethics to be followed by critics. Now, as usual, we will have the overview first. Overview, you have got 12 points here. First one is already, uh, already stated here, morals. Morals and ethical principles. What, what, what are the morals? See, candor, and sincerity, honesty, and true, to be true, etc. As we will see. Second is, when to speak and when to be silent. Uh, that is, speech and silence, we can say. Speech and silence. Certain times we can speak, certain times you should speak. First thing. Always you cannot speak. Although you are a critic, you cannot go on judging throughout your life. There are certain occasions where you have to keep silence. Understand? Then you have got the third is when to tell the truth. Telling the truth. Always you cannot tell the truth. Telling the truth. If you sometimes if you tell the truth bluntly, it will do greater mischief than telling a lie. In life it is like that. So when should you be, when should you bluntly speak the truth? When you should not do. That's the thing. The fourth is uh, a certain group of critics called bookful blockheads. Bookful blockheads. Bookful blockheads. Listen, bookful blockheads. And what are they? Well, they are always attacking people, always reading and always attacking. That is book full of blockheads. And uh, fifth is the ideal critic. The ideal. Ideal critic. Who is the ideal critic? Who is the balanced critic? Okay. And then sixth is he gives half a dozen examples. Examples of ideal and uh, Examples. Half a dozen he gives. That is Aristotle, beginning with Aristotle, uh, Horace, Dionysius, Dionysius, uh, Dionysius, not Dionysius, Dio, Dionysius, Dionysius, uh, you have uh, Longinus. Longinus, Quindilian, Quindilian, see that? Longinus, Quindilian, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, yes. And then you have got the next verse, Dionysius, up, oh, there is another that one, Petroni, Pet Petronicus, Petronicus, Arbiter. Petronius, 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 sorry, Petronius Arbiter. Petronius Arbiter. So these are the six persons he gives. Aristotle begin with Horus, Dionysius, Longinus, Quirinian, Petronius Arbiter. One, two, three, four, five, six. The six examples he gives. So that is um, <coughs> ideal critics, ideal critics. Understand? And seven is, he says, um, the rise and fall of Rome. How is it connected with the learning? Learning and the rise and fall of Rome. When learning declines, Rome declines. That's what it says. And the eighth is contribution made by Erasmus. 
to the most learned man of those days. He was a Dutch man. Erasmus the Dutch. In what way he prevented the decline in learning? Erasmus the Dutch. And naturally the ninth will be revival of learning. Revival of learning. This is the overview of this section. Part 3. And revival of learning and the tenth is uh, the France. France and Bulu. Bulu. Ten. The attitude to attitude of France. You know, Frenchmen. Frenchmen and their attitude. And their <coughs> attitude. Eleven. English attitude. English attitude. Hostile to begin with. English. And then you have got Ross Common and Walsh. <coughs> Learn from Ross Common. Ross Common and Walsh. From whom Pope himself learned many lessons. Critics, writers. So their contribution and how they influenced even, not even, but Pope himself. So we have got 12 points in part two, 3. First is the morals, then when to speak and when to keep silence, telling the truth, when, when to tell the truth, when to tell the whole truth, and then book full blockheads, some critics, so over negative always, attacking, the ideal critic, examples of ideal critics, half a dozen, Aristotle, Aristotle, Horus, Dionysius, Petronius, then you have um, Quindilian and six Longinus. These are the ideal critics. Longinus is sublime, the incarnation of sublime, he says. Okay, then you have got the learning and the rise and fall of Rome. <coughs> when, when learning was in its highest point, peak, Rome flourished, then, then learning declined, Rome also declined, civilization declined. And it was arrested by Erasmus, the Dutchman, the theologian and the philosopher. Then, as a result, revival of learning. Then, attitude of the Frenchman, Boileau and Corneille, towards these rules laid down by the ancients and the attitude of the English towards the rules laid down by the ancients. And then we have got uh, two English writers and critics, there's a Ross Common and uh, <coughs> Walsh. So this, this is how part three is. You can see the uh, different sections. You have to make your own section. There's no section written there, but for our study, for our convenience, we make our own sections like this. Understand? Boundaries is this is point one, point two, point. There may be some overlapping. Some points may be missing. When I say this, when I when I give heading, headings like this, but still we will include all these things in this. I hope you have been enjoying my lectures on uh, Alexander Pope. <coughs> Soon we will be. After this, we will be getting into the Preface to Shakespeare by one of the most eminent writers, lexicographers, critics of the 18th century, and that is Dr. Johns, <coughs> Professor Shakespeare. A monument to his genius. Two monuments to his genius. I am not speaking about Dr. Johnson today, but I am just, uh, you know, a side remark. <laughs> it's a side remark. Two monuments, one is the Professor Shakespeare, and the other is a dictionary of the English language, single-handed, prepared and published by Dr. Johnson in the year 1755. Oh, well, we will come to that later. <clears throat> so today we will discuss four points. First is morals. First, four morals. Morals and ethics. Morals and ethics to be followed by critics. Taste alone will not do. You may be having taste. 
Judgment alone will not. Understand? Judgment alone will not. Trace alone will not. Then, you need learning alone will not. You may be a scholar. You may be a scholar. You may have. You may be having taste. See, that is. I would say that an ideal critic is <coughs> Dr. Johnson himself. When you come back, can, when you after going through these points, you will see that. And another very interesting thing is that whatever Pope has been telling us about the judgments or causes of wrong and judgments, criticism, is also equally applicable in our day-to-day -day life. For example, pride goes before a fall. Envy, the corroding, envy, jealousy, the corroding vice. So such things are applicable for, to us also in our daily life. So learning alone will not do, taste alone will not do, judgment, ability to criticize alone will not do. Then what is required is half of the task of the critic is in, in is morals and ethical principles. You should Follow morals and ethical principles. Half of the half of your task is that. Half of the task of a judge or a critic is to know the morals and ethical principles. General as well as when you are come when you have to apply this to your judgment of uh, creative work. See that learning is okay, must, but truth and candor. That's the thing. Truth. He can say truth and candor. Candor. What is truth and candor means? You have to be true, you have to be sincere, you have to be committed. What you say should be <coughs> supported by examples. But above all, be thy own self, be true. Who said Polonius? To whom his son late is before going to France for his higher studies. And this is applicable to <clears throat> each and every one of us in all the walks of life. Whether it is family life, a student life, teacher life, adults. So be true. True to yourself. Don't be insincere. Don't say one thing and then one thing in one place and say many other things in many other places. That you should have. You may be a learned person, but if you have no commitment and no, you, you, you know, what you say is not true, what is the use? You may be having taste in judgment. Here again, if no candor, no sincerity, no use. So you have to be. That's what I said, Dr. Johnson. He, whenever he is in doubt, he compares. Compares Dr. Warburton or Rowe. Such editions, such opinions of such people, he always consults. Because when he is not true, he is not sure about what he is saying. So he wants to cultivate that. So the most important principle, ethical and moral, is be true to yourself. What you say should be true. Understand? And when you praise a poet, there should be reason for praising. You find an episodic plot. And then you say, oh, it is written by so and so. So you say, oh, um, wonderful. All the rules of unities, unit, all the unities have been observed. Worst thing you must have done. And you are saying like this. What, what do you what use? Understand. Then second is, he says, when to speak and when to speak and when to be silent. Speak and keep silence. When to be, when to speak and when not to speak. When in doubt, be silent. You are in doubt, don't be silent. You remember at the beginning, when T.S. Eliot, the wasteland was published. Oh, some people said it is what nobody is what nobody can. It is a bedlam. It is a confusion. It is chaos. His four quarters have been somebody called somebody said there is a fork. Four, uh, four in, uh, he said, uh, four quarters. Instead of four quarters, it was given the a name that they were for, it was full of chaos. 
Understand? For uh, exact words, sir, exact words uh, that I came across was that for um, a chaotic poems or something like that. So that, so that is, you are, you don't know. Then you please keep silence. And then after that, you know, what happened to the series, the waste Oh, they went on raising the sky was the limit. So now, whom should you believe? So if you are in doubt, please keep quiet. That's what I said. If sure, even if you are sure, speak with diffidence. Some reservation. I think, yes. So, <clears throat> I remember that a gentleman was being interviewed for the post of a lecturer. There were about 12 professors, 11 professors. And uh, one of them asked, what do you think about Walt Whitman? <laughs> that this candidate said, he is not a poet. And some of those uh, professors, you know, they got angry because they were worshipping this man. <laughs> you understand that? So don't say that kind of thing. If you are, if you, even if you, you even if, if that is your sincere opinion, you say, I think. I think always you add that, I think. So don't, in doubt, if you should not. Whenever you commit an error, you know, you should say, you want your error. And be guided by self-criticism. That's very important. Before going to bed every day, you sit somewhere alone. And then just have a review of your day's happenings. And see, where have I gone wrong? If I have gone wrong somewhere, tomorrow I will correct it. The self-criticism is important for self-improvement. Blindly, if you say, oh, whatever I said is true. Sometimes it happens, you know, some, some teachers make mistakes. Teachers make mistakes. <laughs> then uh, one day, uh, once what happened, you know, not once, but what we must always do, including myself. You make a mistake, next day you should go and tell the students. Uh, sorry, yesterday there was a mistake. I... I... A simple example, 1922, the Waste Land was published. And you say, probably, you understand, 1919 it was published. You, suppose you have said it like that, because he TSD started writing it in 1990. So he confused between 1992. And you said, suppose by chance you said 1990. Next day you should go and say that, students. Whether they know it or not, it's not the question. You should go and say, tell them that, see, yesterday I told you, it was 1990. Just when he started writing, and in 22, it was published. You can't be said like that. Only your mistake and self-criticism. Point out my mistakes, definitely I will correct. Have you got any to tell me? Yes? So there we go. That's very important. So when to speak, when you are sure. How to speak with the reservation. When not to speak, when you are not sure. See that <laughs> when you are not, when you doubt, don't speak. And then only your errors and also self criticism. Okay. Now, third, <clears throat> telling the truth. When should you tell the truth? All truths should not be told. All truth you cannot say also. Some you have to sugar called the falsehood and sometimes falsehood is better than telling the truth. If you tell the truth, don't don't bluntly say it. As I just now told you about that candidate. He is not a poet, he says. <laughs> that is too bad. No. What do it mean is not a poet? How can you say like that? You cannot say like that. He is an inferior poet, some people say. Who are you to judge like that? So, blunt truths will do more mischief than good. And suppose, as you ask a student, and you ask a simple question like that. The year when India was, India became independent. 
by chance, suppose he says, in 1945. Then don't say, you don't know even this date, 1947. Don't argue like that. This is what you should do. Ah, oh, yes, very good, very good. So you must have forgotten that, no? Yes. So the landmark year is 1947. And then you probably must have forgotten. It is human to forget. So even if somebody makes a mistake, then tell them in such a way that they have forgotten it, not that they don't know it. So the attitude of the critic also should be like that. How many vowels are there in English to ask a question? Five vowels. Which are the A, E, I, O, U? What, what to do? Then the teacher should say, should, shouldn't say, stupid sila. This is not the way to answer. A, I, U, I, U, U, they are the rest of the alphabet. There are 20 vowels in English. Do you know? No, that is not the way to correct. Then what, what should you do? What should you say? Yes. A, E, I, U, U are vowel letters. Uh, probably you might have forgotten the difference between vowel letters and vowel sounds. There are 12 pure vowel sounds and 8 lift sounds. What do you have got 20 vowels? If you correct it like this, what will happen is the student will appreciate it. So you have forgotten something that you don't know. You should teach them in such a way, oh, they have forgotten it. I am reminding you. Understand? Falsehood <coughs> as if <coughs> taught, as if taught them not, he says. You can tell falsehoods. You can tell a lie. But should be done in such a way that uh, <coughs> they are not hurt. People. Sometimes in Shakespeare drama, you, know, you find obscene passages to be explained. So you cannot blindly in a mixed class or a <coughs> in a, any class for some youngsters. You can't blindly explain those things. Again, some little falsehood you can use, and then uh, as if you teach them, as if you don't teach them. Huh? What is that? That's the art of teaching. <laughs> you teach, the students will not be conscious of the fact that you are teaching. You are teaching, but the students are not conscious of the fact. <clears throat> if you want, I will give an example. Uh, that is, Semantics, you know, semantics, change of meaning. One day I remember a teacher, so he came to the class and then he said, he did not say semantics, instead of he said, have you seen that signboard there in a, in a particular junction? Yes. What is written on that? It is written, come to Anjali for the rest of your life. Anjali is the name of a hotel. So come to Anjali for the rest of your life. Huh? So the teacher said, that is semantics. <laughs> what is a man? Rest of your life has two meaning. <coughs> Rest of means remaining years of your life. The other is you are taking some time of roofing, resting. And then the teacher said, this is semantics, means change of meaning. So what happens is that you are taught not knowing, not Becoming conscious of the fact that you are being taught. Like that. When you are telling falsehood, you should say it in such a way that you are not telling falsehood. See, there is an art of a critic. Some film reviews you can see now. You go, are you reading film reviews in the Hindu? <clears throat> then you can see. They speak, the writers write in such a way, actually they are totally against that feeling. But they, they write in such a way, only towards the end you will know that it was a skating criticism on the feeling, not an appreciation. That's why you should criticize. And now the fourth one is, <coughs> bookful blockheads. Bookful blockheads. This is the fourth. Today only we will discuss you 
<coughs> discuss only these three, uh, sorry, four points. He said, they read, ignorantly read, they don't know anything. See that? They have got loads of lumber in his head. Lumber. Lumber room, you know, what is lumber room? Where you put all the useless things. So, you have got, they have learned lumber, all useless theories and so on in their head. And he educates himself. As the text says, his own tongue edifies his own ears. Edifies, educates. His own ears. He talks to himself. He reads all books. What is the purpose of them? To attack them. Already he has got this in his mind. Hmm. I will give one to this. So he reads all books to, to assail them. He will attack Dryden. Imagine. Also he will attack inferior poets and writers like Durfi. D-U-R-F-E-Y. Durfi's tales. From Dryden's fables to Durfi's tales. Then what will the others do? They run away with their books. Some of them, they have given it for sale, they buy back. Publication, they take it and run away. Where will they go? They go to St. Paul's Church. And in churchyard, St. Paul's Churchyard, the headquarters, the booksellers. See, they run away from there. And they go to altars of the churches to hide themselves. But these people will rush in there, rush there. That's why in the famous quote, fools rush in where angels fear to tread. So the authors of books, they take their books from the churchyard and run away to, they hide themselves behind the altars of the churches to save themselves from, to escape from these blockheads full blockers who have no sense, who have some old forgotten theories in their head, whose main purpose of reading a book is to attack. It is already their prejudice layers everywhere. So to save their books there, they steal their books or they buy back their books. Then they will go everywhere in search of these people. And then fools rush in. Where? Angels fear to turn. So they in, sac in the sacred place, Sangdun Sangdorim of the church, that is the altar, the books, the others are hiding with their books like this. But they are rushing. That is what it is. Fools rushing. F fools mean this blockheads. This block, this block full, book full blockheads. Blockheads mean fools. Idiots. Rushing. See? And then they are, they are rattling nonsense. Be, 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 rattling nonsense. Never shot. Never turned aside. You can push them. Go from here. They don't want you here. They are not shot. You don't, please don't come here. And you cannot turn them aside. So what happened? They will always be bursting out, restless, with a thundering tide. Oh. <laughs> what a terrible thing to Well, they will be saying. Is it? Thundering time. All oh, nonsense. Absolute nonsense. About their books. So that is diametrically opposite to what a critic should be. They have some nonsensical ideas in their heads. They read all the books. They go after the others. They go to headquarters of booksellers, they get, they start reading, their main purpose is attacking, then the others, they buy back or steal their books and run away, they hide themselves behind all this, but these fools rushing, well, they rattle out nonsense, they are never shocked, you cannot turn them aside, they are restless, and with a thun thundering tide, they will be attacking. Oh, terrible. So, yes. so there you are. So today we have seen so far 12 different points that the overview 
and four points we have already seen morals and ethics, truth and candor. So half of the task of the critic is he should be, he should have, a, he should act his conscience, no? morals by the act by the guidance of morals and ethical principles. Then speak when you are in speak not when you are in doubt. Speak with diffidence when you know. If you don't know anything, please keep quiet. This is know your errors and also by self-criticism review yourself. Telling the truth is good, but always always don't tell blunt truths. Sometimes you have to uh, truth has to be <coughs> sugar-coated with falsehood, but at the same thing, the receiving end should not know that you are doing such a such an acrobatics with words. Then you saw the book full block hats. So the book full in two ways. One is they read all the books. Second is they run after all the books. And third also you can say their head is filled with lumber. See lumber. Learn, learn at lumber, means useless knowledge in their head. And so they criticize, I am the rightest <laughs> one. Right? I hope you are following. So, <clears throat> if you enjoy your, enjoy my classes and useful, what you, you can do one thing, is one, one, one very important thing, that is you subscribe and tell your friends and classmates to do the same thing. I uh, see after all, this is an open platform, you see. Uh, Therefore, you can it will be helpful. Definitely, hope that you will be doing some some such a positive thing, and uh, <coughs> see you again tomorrow. In the next class, it may not be tomorrow. In the next class, uh, have a nice time. Enjoy your life. Bye.